challenging. We need to be in top physical and spiritual condition to overcome the challenges we are increasingly faced with. To help us in this fight, Health Ministries is presenting presentations designed to help us become a better you in 22. Today's presentation on appetite and fasting will lay the groundwork for better physical and spiritual health and help in our character development. Let's bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide us with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you give us wisdom and understanding so that we can understand your word. Give us a desire to improve our health. Give us a a desire to understand our bodies. And we give all the thanks and praise in Jesus Christ's holy, righteous name. Amen. Amen. So, appetite and fasting, subjects for a time like this. The world is getting a little bit crazier day by day. So, what exactly is appetite? According to Collins Dictionary, your appetite is your desire to eat. According to the Oxford Dictionary, whoops, let's go the other way, thank you. According to Oxford Dictionary, it is a strong desire or liking for something. A desire, this is more on the level of feelings. This isn't a need, but uh, remember that word desire, your desire to eat, your desire, this could be, appetite could be for food, it could be for money, riches, could be for power, could be for sex, drugs, for many things. Now, hunger, on the other hand, according to Merriam-Webster, dictionary, is a craving or urgent need for food or a specific nutrient. An uneasy sensation, this is B, an uneasy sensation occasioned by the lack of food. So the two are very different. Looks like we got kicked out of the program. Is that me or you, Sammy? my connection with the church internet leave. Yep. We lost our internet connection for a second. I've noticed this unusual phenomenon. (laughs) I I discussed it with Carlos earlier. Anytime I do a health presentation, mysterious things start happening. Yesterday, I had my day all planned out. On Thursday, I planned out Friday or earlier in the week. Sure enough, I get a call, an emergency. We had to take care of something and uh, kind of threw off my day. But I ended the day pretty good and actually felt great at the end of the day. And I laid down and I I thanked God and I said, I feel so good. 
I couldn't get to sleep. I got about three hours sleep last night. And it was just something just gnawing on you that you can't, you don't understand. Your brain's not in that place. Satan doesn't want us to be healthy. If you're not healthy, you're going to die. And then, what are you going to, what are you going to, how are you going to preach the gospel if you're dead? How are you, how are you going to help your family? So, there, there is an, an enemy who does not want us to be healthy does not want us to control our appetites. So we discussed appetite, we discussed hunger. Hunger versus appetite, what's the difference? Whilst hunger is the instinct of survival that drives us to feed when the body requires food, Appetite, on the other hand, is the feeling that we need to eat that is influenced by psychological aspects of the individual concern, i.e. desire to eat for pleasure, desire to eat for happiness, desire to eat because you're bored, sadness, anxiety, etc. That's from nutrition magazine, but they they explain that very well. So there's a difference between just being hungry and appetite. Appetite, you usually, we usually think of appetite in the sense of getting carried away, of feelings. Hunger is an actual need. Now the very first case of uncontrolled appetite was by a being who was a very was an angel named Lucifer. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 15, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in you. And in chapter 28, verse 17, also of Ezekiel, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy reason, thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So something happened in the thinking. He started thinking and desiring something that that wasn't his and had all his thoughts as we'll see in a moment, on himself. In Isaiah 14, 13, uh, we, we can really see how the, what the thinking process it was. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Five times, I will, in in one verse. I, all his thoughts are on himself, I will shows the, that he is going to do this. He has the resolve to do this. I will do this. I will exalt myself. I will put myself over God. His appetite just went berserk. And in this verse, it tells us the problem with uncontrolled appetite. Nobody else matters but you. And the only... The only reason that he'd even want anybody else around is to worship him, you know, to, when you're number one, automatically everybody else is number two, right? But God does it differently. He, he, he shares. In uh, the next, the, uh, 
Another verse here in Isaiah. How art thou falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So this is the, the uh, outcome. This is what happened to him because of his uncontrolled appetite. He got kicked out of heaven. He was like, what, the second, or I mean God, Jesus. He was the highest ranking angel, and it just wasn't good enough. He let his appetite run wild, uncontrolled. Now, unfortunately for us, <laughs> he came here. And he spoke with the first uh, woman and tempted her in Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He made an attack on her appetite. He said, think about it, you know. First off, God's a liar. He told you he'll die. I assure you, you won't. And tells us how Satan works. But ye shall be as gods. So, I don't know if she was already thinking these thoughts or he put them in her head. But she, her appetite started getting into uncontrolled ter territory. And what happens next, in Genesis 3, verse 6, Satan's got um, Eve working on her feelings now. She's less, left reason. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired. Remember I told you, remember that word, desire? Desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband with her and he did eat. So, not after much time with Satan, she is totally working on feelings and her appetite is out of control. If she had taken some preparation, she might have said, let me go run this by Adam. Or, God's usually here in the evening. Let me run it by him. Meet me here tomorrow. Sounds interesting. No. Her, and that's the problem with uncontrolled appetite. You just want what you want. And you want it now. And nothing else, nobody else matters. And what's the consequences of that? Well, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So the consequences of that intemperate or uncontrolled appetite was that all men will die. And we know that. We've seen, we, have, we don't know anyone <laughs> that's made it out alive, right? Everybody dies. And the children, Adam and Eve's children, which we all are, had the same issue. Esau. In Genesis 25, verses 29 to 34, once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. That's why he's also called Edom. Edom comes from the word red. Jacob replied, Jacob was a shrewd one, first, sell me your birthright. 
Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stool. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This was an interesting one because this one, we have the combination of hunger. He says he's hungry, he's famished. <clears throat> but his uncontrolled appetite for that food, he, he can't wait. He can't wait. And he makes this decision, and he gave up a big, uh, big price here. He was the... He was the, the first son. He had the blessing coming. But he gave it all up for one meal. So the results of Esau's uncontrolled appetite in Hebrews 12, verses 16 and 17. Watch out that no one becomes involved in sexual sin or becomes careless about God as Esau did. He traded his rights as the oldest son for a single meal. And afterwards, when he wanted those rights back again, it was too late, even though he wept bitter tears of repentance. So remember and be careful. In other words, be thinking. You, you can't let the emotions, you can't let the appetite just run. We have to... God, what does God say? He says, come and reason with me. Not come and let's talk about our emotions. Um, we all have emotions, but the point is, if we don't control them, Esau lost a great deal over one meal. And a lot of people in the world are losing their lives over meals. They just can't bring themselves to eat what they should be eating, or they can't stop a habit, alcohol. I had a good friend, passed in his 50s. He cared about wine more than he cared about food. It was amazing, and you see it, you could talk to people, they can't hear you. We, we should not have that problem. And there was a bunch of folks <laughs> called the Israelites who were always having this problem of uncontrolled appetite. In Numbers, chapter 11, verses 4 to 6, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Does anybody believe the slaves actually had that many choices? I'm not sure that they did. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside the manna before our eyes. Now, if you ever looked into manna, in the Bible, it's called the food of the angels. It tastes like honey, uh, coliander seeds and honey wafer. Thank you. Um, it actually sounds like it might be pretty tasty, you know. But if your appetite gets the better of you, you're going to be thinking there's something better and you're going to want it regardless of the consequences. And what were the consequences? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. God gave them the meat, but soon after that, they were falling dead. They gave up their lives for, like Esau, for a meal. Now, there are a couple examples in the Old Testament, and there's probably more than a couple, but we're just going to concentrate on a couple, where there were some good decisions made. 
everybody that we're going to talk to about today, that I'm going to talk about, has, has some sin in their life, but there were some points where they made some critical right decisions at the right time. Joseph was one of these. In Genesis chapter 39, verses 10 to 12, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, well, she is Potiphar's wife. Uh, as you recall, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt, and he ended up working for Potiphar, serving Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife had uncontrolled appetite. She took, uh, after a couple looks at Joseph, he's a young guy, he was strong, came from good lineage. She wanted him. She spoke to him day after day. He refused. He didn't let his appetite uh, take over. He refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. He arranged his life the best he could not to be with her alone. And then we'll see what happens in a second. When that does happen, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and possibly she sent the servants out. We don't know that, but suspicious that they weren't there. They were always there, it seems. Come to bed with me. She had uncontrolled appetite. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. He didn't stop to negotiate over the cloak. You know, I, I kind of need that cloak. It's, it's kind of valuable. Eh, come in the bedroom, I'll give it to you. you know? He would have been in trouble. He didn't stop. He ran. So he refused and he ran. What were the consequences of that decision? What was his reward? Well, in Genesis 41, verses 38 to 41, I heard somebody say jail, but jail didn't last long. And Pharaoh, jail was just a, a chance that God put Joseph where he wanted him to reward him in a bigger way. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Now, Joseph interpreted some dreams for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath done thee all this, has shown thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. That wasn't the only good choice Joseph made. He made a lot of good choices. And he became second in uh, leadership of the most powerful country on the planet and set up God's people because there was a famine going on so that God's Abraham's seed would be safe and fix them up with the nicest piece of property where they could farm. So his controlling of his appetite paid off for Abraham's seed, which later brings Jesus Christ. Another, uh, we'll say, hero in the Old Testament, who, though flawed, when the time came for a serious, some serious decisions, he turned his life around and made a lot of them. We'll talk about one of them. In Hebrew, chapter 11, verses 24 to 27, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather 
than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And he knew what those treasures were. He grew up at the palace, remember? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now, what was his reward? Well, for one thing, he became the, the leader of the whole nation of Israel, led him out of slavery, saw God face to face. But in, uh, also in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 3, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brothers of James and led them up a high mountain by themselves, where he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes become as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Adam's not there. Esau's not there, but Moses was and Elijah was. Another one we could mention would be David. David had opportunities. If he didn't have control of his appetite, he was encouraged to end Saul's life and take the kingdom before God actually fully put it in his hands. But he refused to do that. He stood up against everybody and said, we are not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. God hasn't gave that to me yet. He controlled his appetite. Well, this problem of appetite that uh, began with Satan and then Satan passed it on to Eve, we all have a problem with appetite. We all have a problem with sin. And we know that at that time, when that happened, there was a plan of salvation set in motion. And Jesus would set us an example of what we should do. So if we go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. So Jesus isn't going into this just without thinking about it. He's praying about it. He's thinking about it. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He is making a connection with God to be ready for this epic battle because, you know, as they say, all the marbles... <laughs> for, were placed on this confrontation. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. In this one, we have two things going on. We have he's hungry, so we have the bread. We have the hunger. But Jesus overcame the hunger. We also have Satan trying to affect his appetite, to, to his pride. If, if you're the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. Well, most people, if we're people, if it was one of us in that situation, we might say, if, what are you talking about if? Let me show you. Bam, bam. Jesus didn't do that because if he had did that, he was destroying this plan of salvation. It wasn't going to happen. But he answered and said, he went right to the word of God, it is written. And a note for those that think, you know, I know a lot of times, not here like other places, but people want to be fighting with Satan. Oh, we've got to bring fight to Satan. Jesus didn't do that. He went to the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
And he lived that. That's where he took Satan, right to the word of God. And in Matthew, uh, same chapter, but we're going to verses 5 and 6, because there's actually three temptations. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, there we go again, trying to get his pride. If you, you know, act, I don't even believe you're God. You can't do this. Cast thyself down, prove it to me, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee the up. Least at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, took him back to the Bible. It is written again. You didn't get it the first time. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And in verses 8 to 10. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. And notice Jesus didn't argue with them and say, Ah, they're not yours to give. He didn't have that conversation. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. Here we see what Satan is looking for. I'm number one. Everyone should fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, third time, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Three times, and three times to Scripture. I like how this topic, and I, and I got interested in this topic because of uh, something Ellen White said in Patriarchs and Prophets. But on Councils on Diet and Health on page 59, she puts this together very succinctly. Adam and Eve fell through intemperate appetite. Christ came and withstood the fiercest temptation of Satan, and on behalf of the race, overcame appetite, showing that man may overcome. Sometimes we seem to question that. Well, can we, can I overcome that? Can I? No, God, Jesus showed us that we can overcome things. Now, we don't take God out of anything, and that's the difference. That's, that's, we, sh- we don't even have to say that because we know that God made us, we're thankful he made us. We know that we only get salvation because he's a good, generous God. But he expects us to do some things. And one of them is to overcome appetite. We have to make some decisions. As Adam fell through appetite, not hunger, they weren't hunger, there was plenty of food to eat there, and lost blissful Eden. The children of Adam may, through Christ, overcome appetite and through temperance in one or two things, no, in all things, regain Eden. So we have to apply some of the principles uh, like from Joseph. We have to refuse. We have to Make a decision. A decision of character is required. And again, we're going to councils on diet and foods, which is interesting that in diet and foods, things that are talked about, it it all works together, character and appetite. To deny appetite requires decision of character. For want of this decision, multitudes are ruined. Weak, pliable, easily led, many men and women fail utterly of becoming what God desires them to be. 
Those who are destitute of decision of character cannot, cannot make a success of the daily work of overcoming. The world is full of bespotted, intemperate, uncontrolled, weak-minded men and women, and how hard it is for them to become genuine Christians. We have to learn to control our appetites. To control our appetites takes character. So we have to do something to develop our character. We have to practice. And we'll talk about that. That's where fasting is going to come in. Again, third time, consoles on diet and foods because she just explains it just so succinctly. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. It's kind of um, it's kind of like they talk about drugs. There's a, a, a gateway drug. You know, people start with alcohol and then marijuana. This leads to that. Well, it turns out that food is a gateway to other sins. If you can't control your food, your diet, you're going to have more trouble controlling other aspects of your life. An uncontrolled appetite for food will lead to uncontrolled appetite for other things. We'll be, we won't have the resolution to say no because we never say no to our appetite. We have to say no. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. We can look around, we know that's true. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and difficult to overcome. That is from, again, Council on Diet and Foods. The main points of that are those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. I hate to bring you that news. I don't, I mean, I, I hate to just from the sense that <laughs> I'm telling you that we have to control our appetite or we're doomed to failure. If, but there's good news, number two is good news. If you can control appetite, you can gain victory over every other temptation of Satan. And three, as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and difficult to overcome. What should we do? Well, we're going to go to Ellen White one more time because she really does have an understanding on this subject. Now and onward till the close of time, the people of God should be earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of their leader. And she's talking about Jesus. They should set aside days for fasting and prayer. Entire abstinence from food may not be required, but they should eat sparingly of the most simple food. Fasting is actually the oldest health technique, theory, whatever you'd like to call it. In the Bible, Moses was the earliest one we have a record of fasting, so that makes it at least 4,000 years old. 
it probably is older than that. In the Bible, we have many examples of fasting. Moses, before receiving God's law. David, mourning his child's illness. David again, mourning the death of Abner. Elijah, he was another one that fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was uh, at the top of his game, it seemed. He got a hold of all the false prophets, and they, and they killed them. And then the scary lady, Jezebel, came after him. He took off a running. I dare say I would, too. She sounded pretty scared. And he ended up, he needed to. He needed to get back. He kind of forgot there for a moment that God had gave him the strength to get rid of the false prophets. And to be scared of one human, he just lost it for a second there. But he fasted to get back, you know, 40 days, 40 nights. Ezra, they fasted to humble themselves and ask for a safe journey back to Judah. Nehemiah, over the condition of Jerusalem, while the, uh, while the Jews were in Babylon, the temple and such went into very, you know, stuff was destroyed. Esther, so she could go safely before the king. So there's a lot of different, we can see there's a lot of different reasons to fast. And it's, um, in, in the New Testament, it's listed with prayer, prayer and fasting. That's what Jesus did. Darius, a pagan, fasting, to deliver Daniel from the lion's den. Daniel again, mourning over the vision. The Ninevites, pagans again. When Jonah went there, asking for, to re, they were repenting and petitioning for forgiveness. Don't destroy our city. Don't. Jesus, we talked about that, 40 days and nights before his temptation in the wilderness. Anna in the New Testament, fasting and uh, worshiping night and day and praying at the temple. Paul, after his encounter with Jesus. The early church, worshiping and fasting. Fasting, we'll talk about this more this afternoon. We have a presentation on fasting, juice fasting. Fasting, when we shut off the digestive system and give it a break and the elimination organs, they're still working, but everything's quieted once you stop eating. And you, your head is clearer and you can think clearer and you get closer to God. And as we saw, example after example, when somebody was in, in trouble, David, he, when he heard his child was sick, what did he do? He put on sackcloth, some ashes on his head, and he fasted. He just went into fasting. Fasting for spiritual reasons brings health benefits, physical benefits. The fasting we'll be talking about this afternoon, physical, it's still, they're hooked up. It brings spiritual benefits. And the reason, well, there's two reasons I hooked the two together, appetite and fasting. Uh, first, as I said, because the, I became interested in, in the subject after Ellen White mentioned it in Patriarchs and Prophets. But as I studied it more, I could see the relationship that it had and the place when we put the when we lay this all out the answer is we have to do something to get control of our appetite 
to, so that we can build the character we need or we're going to be in trouble. Fasting is a tool that we can use to get closer to God and develop a habit of controlling. It's, it's like an exercise. So anytime something happens that you need to give to God, you just start fasting. That should be, that's the example throughout the Bible. We need to understand that. You know, something happens, if someone in your relative is in a car wreck, you might want to fast. You're being attacked, you want to fast. To develop our character, we want to exercise our appetite. We can purposely fast for spiritual, for spiritual and health. But if, if our life's pretty good right now and we don't, I've said to a couple people, I said, you, you know, we're talking about the subject, do you ever miss a meal? <laughs> we, are, we are conditioned in this country to eat three meals a day. This is not how it always was. There was a time when like one meal a day was the custom. But it's became three a day, snacks in between the meals, and a snack before bed, which is the worst time of day to eat. Now I know all of us don't do all that, but that's the custom, and we have trouble breaking away from that. So I challenge you, can you miss a meal? Can you believe whatever it is that's driving you nuts, ice cream, cake, candy, can you leave it alone for a week? Can you exercise your character? Can you get control of your appetite? We can purposely, what, what athletes do is they go out and uh, let's say they might be the, the disc thrower. They don't just throw the disc. They'll be in the gym lifting weights to get stronger and stronger, and they'll practice the disc. We know challenges are coming. We see things getting more difficult day by day. Things are crazy, the things you hear now. Unbelievable. We have to be prepared. We need to be stronger physically and spiritually. Let's exercise. We can exercise and con by controlling our appetite. Set, it, set your mind to miss a, a meal occasionally. Set your mind to miss a day of food once you, get, you build it up. This will help us, this exercising will help us get control of our body and help us to develop our character. Final thought. I'm sorry, I think I said before, last Ellen White, but from the Review and Herald, 1881, let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that intemperance, that is lack of control, is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. If you regard your health with indifference, not only will we die here, we'll die an eternal death. Intemperance is a sin and will affect our spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. We need to know that, believe it. We need to get that in our brains and get our brains reasoning and be prepared for the difficult times we know are coming. Let's bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get together and study your word. We ask that you give us wisdom and understanding to apply your word to our lives. And we give you all the thanks and all the glory in your Son, Jesus Christ, holy, righteous name. Amen.